Harriet is a social scientist uh, who has been uh, working on one of the biggest uh, projects uh, around smart grids. And I am agog <coughs> to hear what she has to say about it. So, Harriet, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks everybody for coming, it's a great pleasure to be here um, and uh, to share with you some of the insights from the customer-led network revolution project or the CLNR project. Um, I'm wanting to really bring today a social science perspective on questions around the smart grid uh, but I'll also try to give you a little bit of more insight into some of the uh, engineering and data aspects of the project as well. But I am a social scientist so please be gentle with me on those kind of questions. I will, I'll do my best to answer anything that you have or direct you to where you can find out more information. So just before I get into telling you a bit more about the kind of approaches we've been taking on the project, I thought it was best to start off by introducing you to CLNR. Uh, it's an off-gen funded project uh, under the Low Carbon Network Fund led by Northern Power Grid, the DNO for the north of England, covering this area here. So <coughs> for those of you who aren't uh, geographers, this is about Sheffield, uh, <laughs> that's the Scottish borders, and that's effectively the midline of the Pennines. So Northern Power Grid, that's their patch, as they call it, um, and they led the project, working with British Gas as a retailer, um, EA Technology, National Energy Action, and Newcastle and Durham Universities. This is one way of imagining what the project looks like. Um, it's one of the largest smart grid demonstration projects that's been run in the UK, value of about 56 million pounds, contributed both through the LCNF, but also by <coughs> British Gas and Northern Power Grid. It comprises 22 different trials, uh, as we call them, or we actually, in, in project language, we call them test cells. Um, so if the acronym TC creeps into my presentation, that stands for test cell. Um, so all the different uh, test cells that we did contained uh, a different mixture between low carbon technologies, uh, tariffs, uh, customers of various kinds. Um, most of our work was with residential customers, or the work that I'm going to talk to you about today was with residential customers. We also had trials with SMEs, which I'm not going to present about today, but I'm very happy to discuss that in questions. This is what we call the small customers side of the project. There's also a large customer side of the project where we're working with uh, industrial and commercial companies and their ability to be flexible in response to peak demand events. And there's also a large network component to the project, including, I believe, Europe's biggest battery and all sorts of other fancy, uh, well, fancy and also quite mundane technologies put into place in real networks across the DNO's patch in order to see how the network would respond to various kinds of demand side interventions. Okay, so that's one way of examining the project and this is effectively the part of the project that I'm going to be talking about is what we call our small customers work. So what I want to do today in about 40 minutes, uh, it's a large project, it's run for four years, the social science team on the project was eight people, the total academic number of people who've had their hands on the project at one point or another is probably about 26, uh, so that's a lot of people and a lot of work and 40 minutes is not a lot of time to talk about it all, so it's really going to be a little bit of a whirlwind uh, tour of that, um, but again hopefully it will whet your appetite to find out more or ask me more questions. So I'm going to say something about why smart grids and energy futures have come to be thought about together in the UK context. I'm going to make the argument that we need to give the smart grid a social life and say a little bit about how we did that or our approach. I'll tell you a little bit about the methods that we use and the data that we've created. And then I'm going to focus on two um, aspects of our findings. The first is about how electricity is used every day. Uh, and the second is about what kinds of conduct happen when smart uh, interventions are made into electricity use in the home. Okay, so this kind of argument is probably familiar with most of you in the audience. The idea that the energy system in the UK, and particularly the electricity transmission network, faces a trilemma. Uh, the relationship between ageing infrastructure, a low carbon transition, integration of renewables and affordability, leading to uh, 
emerging challenges for how we structure the provision of electricity in the UK. This is the way in which the CLNR project uh, frame this. So the greater use of renewable energy and the electrification of heating and transport being central to UK government plans for the low carbon transition, but that UK electricity networks are not designed to provide that kind of uh, system or that kind of service. Um, and so we need different kinds of interventions in order to think about how to transform the grid um, to provide that kind of transition. So that's the way in which the smart grid is, if you like, becoming linked to our sense of what energy futures might look like. On the whole, though, this idea of the smart grid has been rather um, generally discussed. It's a collective or umbrella term for a whole host of array of interventions that are capable of addressing one or other aspects of this challenge. There's no clear or universal definition of what a smart grid involves. Each player in the smart grid uh, economy, if you like, or in the smart grid politics, will uh, define it slightly differently. But traditionally it's been regarded as a discrete set of technical financial kinds of interventions through which we could start to try to realise the provision of electricity differently, and in particular how we could try to make electricity demand more flexible in response to the kinds of supply that we have. In this sort of reading of the smart grid as a largely technical project, questions about society are usually relegated to questions around how do we improve consumer acceptance of smart grid technologies, i.e., for example, how do we achieve the rollout of smart meters? How do we get customers to accept smart meters? That's the kind of social science question that we might ask. We might also ask what level of incentive do people need in order to become more flexible? So we're seeking here to bring social or society into the smart grid. We're trying to engage customers with an existing sort of technical project to which they uh, must fit. Our research sought to try to do something slightly differently in that we wanted to understand how the smart grid might be made to fit with customers rather than customers fit uh, with the smart grid. We start from a few, different, a few different sort of angles, I suppose. We're a large different sort of social science team, uh, anthropologists, geographers, my own background's in political geography and urban geography, um, and we have, uh, we have quantitative anthropologists and also uh, anthropologists who study at the home on our project. But we came up with a kind of approach where we thought about smart grid as a new assemblage, a socio-technical assemblage, and also a governmental logic, a governmental program through which to change the provision of electricity. So, that work I'm not really going to talk about very much today, but we've been doing some work on how the assemblage of the smart grid and its idea as a governmental project has shaped the kind of interventions that we see um, here in the UK, but we also had a master's student doing some comparative work on different kinds of smart grid projects emerging across Europe and America. But from this starting point of thinking of the smart grid as a new socio-technical order or a new ordering of the way in which we provide electricity, we argue that the successful making of the smart grid requires its alignment through new kinds of subjectivities, new kinds of consumers who are capable of being subject to the electricity network in different ways. And to understand this, we want to look at the way in which customers normalize using electricity energy at the moment and how that happens through practice. So we take a socio-technical approach, a political approach and one based on theories of practice in our work to understand the social life of the smart grid. So the question that I'm really going to focus on today is this last one. How are practices, the things that we do every day at home through which we use electricity, being reconfigured through interventions for smart grids? So that's the, the question to which I'm concerned. We can debate questions about how acceptable are technologies and what kinds of incentives do people want. Those are questions that we have also addressed. But it's going to be this question that's at the heart of what I'm talking about today. So why did we go for a practices approach? Uh, this is, a, as I'm sure many of you are aware, who's, who take social uh, science perspectives on energy questions, this is a very live debate. 
but effectively we wanted to move away from the idea of consumers making choices about energy consumption as if you were choosing a product on a supermarket shelf such as a bottle of ketchup uh, we uh, agree that there are of course moments of economic choice in the energy uh, domain and indeed in the energy market for example when you choose a supplier that is like choosing a bottle of ketchup but when you're using energy in the home it's not so much a matter of choice from our understanding of the literature and also from some of the preliminary work we did with consumers in the first year of the project. It's more a matter of routine. It's more a matter of what you do every day. So do you wash your clothes and hang them up on a radiator um, on the line outside or put them in the tumble dryer? It's not the same as a kind of choice about a consumption product. It's about the way in which your life is organized inside your domestic sphere. And that's why we thought a practices approach could help us. So we are not so interested, although our work did consider the ways in which different attitudes might shape behaviors and create change. Instead, we're interested in the gearing of everyday social practices. And we've developed this uh, model we're calling it at the moment. It's rather provisional. We're not quite sure whether it's a model or not. But the gears really work for engineers. All the engineers on the project really like the fact that this is gears. They really enjoy that. They could deal with the rest of it quite happily now that it's gears. Um, and through, particularly through the grounded work we did in households, which I'll tell you a bit about later, we looked through all of the interview material. Uh, we did about 250 interviews of between one and two hours long with SMEs and domestic customers, so we have a lot of material. We've almost broken Vivo with this stuff. We had to get the specialists from head office in Vivo to come help us. We were working the system at the limit. Um, to sort of try and uh, working with this material to think about, well, what was it that people were telling us was shaping how they were using energy every day? And we came up with these five uh, different uh, things. Capacities, the ability and potential both for objects, artifacts and forms of knowledge and techniques to use energy and provide energy services. So the capacity of a kitchen which is equipped with a microwave is different from the capacity of a kitchen which is not in order in the ways in which it uses electricity, for example. Conventions, the patterns of meaning and disposition, the way we do things that shape conduct, shape our everyday uh, behavior. So um, some conventions you might be very familiar with, things like whether you have a Sunday roast or not. That's a convention. Um, it becomes a habit or a norm. Other conventions are rather personal about how you dry your laundry. So conventions can be at an individual or household level or they can be at a more social or community level. Rhythms, that's kind of temporalities that people experience in their everyday lives. School run, your working shifts, those kind of things. And the difference between weekends and weekdays. And also quite a lot of our work, and there's a paper um, in review at the moment, looked at the idea of the evening as a particular time and space through which a whole set of these practices are um, shoveled effectively, creating energy peaks. So the evening is a particular kind of rhythm that people have in their everyday lives. Economies, how we manage social, natural and financial resources in the home. So we, we came across a lot of what you might associate with sort of 1950s household ec economics lessons about how people were managing their everyday uh, lives. And this was about people moving, they're drying around the house to capture the sunlight, people deciding to do their washing on a windy day to make advantage of the natural resources outside, people budgeting um, their energy bills and so on and so forth, uh, and thinking about the different kinds of resources that they had that they could use to manage their household uh, in quite interesting ways. And then structures, both um, the enduring physical structures, the built-in environment in which people are living, but also the sort of structures in terms of age, demographics, social class and so on, which also shape um, the way in which electricity is used. So these are the things which came out of our interview material. And um, what we effectively say is that if you, if you gear this, if conventions start to change, then these other things can change too. So these are gears in a system that relate to one another. So that's our basic approach that we've uh, developed in order to try to understand the social life of smart grids. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the methods that we use and the data that we collected before sharing with you some of our findings. There are five learning outcomes for the CLNR project. 
don't ask me to remember what the other three are, <laughs> but basically there are two which are focused on um, customers and customer flexibility, two focused on network flexibility, which are three and four, and the fifth one is about joining it together to understand what overall flexibility can be gained for the electricity system through the combination of customer and network flexibility. So these were the two outcomes that we were focused on as a social science team. Um, and these are the different ways in which we were engaged. The social science team helped with the design of the trial so that a variety of different socio-demographic groups would be included um, in terms of the 12,000 people who became involved. Um, we looked at data of one kind or another for 12,000 people across these 22 trials. And just to say that most participants were British Gas smart meter customers four years ago. Um, some of them came onto the trial two years ago uh, and that means there's a particular set of socio-demographic criteria which shape how British Gas roll out of smart meters and therefore shape who it is who's involved in the trial, which I can tell you more about later. Other participants in the heat pump trials and in the electric vehicle trials were recruited through other intermediaries, partly because the markets for both of those technologies are not sufficiently advanced as the trial proceeded there are much lower numbers of heat pumps and EVs out there than were predicted when the project was bid for and indeed in government figures. So our focus on this idea of customer flexibility was derived from three sources of data, each of which is a really substantial piece of work in its own right, the combination of which um, I think has provided us with some really interesting insights and is still in a sense, the combination of bringing these things together was very much the thing that we were doing in the last few months of the project, and there's still a lot of work that could be done with this material. So we looked at electricity use for 9,000 customers in a control group um, who were asked to opt out. They were British Gas Smart Meter customers, half of whom were in the region of the DNO, and half of whom came from the rest of the UK, and who were asked to opt out of the trial if they didn't want their data to be collected and analysed in this way we had about a 2% dropout rate on the trial. Um, and that was collected for the control group and the other intervention test cells. The other intervention trials was collected at half hourly intervals. Apart from for one more detailed monitoring cell, again, which I'm not going to talk to you about today, but I have got some information at my fingertips that I could tell you about where we collected 10 minute interval data. We did an online survey. Um, it was run twice, summer 2012 and in spring 2013, with a total of over 900 respondents. Um, and that asked questions around attitudes and behavior, um, energy technologies in the home, and different kinds of consumption practice. And then we did face-to-face -face interviews with 186 participants. We did a total of 250 interviews. So that's probably, <coughs> as I say, the largest uh, research project on energy use in the UK to date. Okay, so what did we find out? Okay. So the first, probably in one of the most sort of headline uh, findings from the project is that in the analysis of the 9,000 customers in the control group, um, we did this analysis in various different ways, including bottom-up clustering methods. Again, don't ask me about the actual statistical techniques that we use. Um, and in terms of actually sorting the sample by categorizations that we already had, we found no clustering and very little um, forms of association between what we would call conventional demographics or compound demographics and levels of electricity use. So age, type of house, what mosaic category you're in, uh, whether you read the Telegraph or the Daily Mail, uh, and so on and so forth, made uh, no statistically significant difference to the level of electricity consumption of your household, apart from income. So income was the only statistically significant variable controlling the level of electricity use across the sample. aside from whether you had a rural off-gas property where you were using electricity for heating, which was a, a minority of the households that we looked at, but we could quite easily see them. So higher income households use more electricity. The gap between higher and lower income households in the peak period increases, and that's not only on a daily peak, but in a seasonal peak as well. 
So the difference between the level of electricity being used by the poorest households or the lower income households and the highest income households increases as we get into peak conditions. One of the reasons why these factors were not significant is because of the high level of variation in the sample. So individual households, the way in which they use electricity is very varied in the week, day to day, and also week to week. So with a large amount of variation in the sample, then significance for social categorizations is difficult to achieve, even when you've got a very large sample with multiple different kinds of levels of demographics in it. We did a principal components analysis of our survey responses of the attitudinal questions that we asked, and we had a subset of 383 responses where we also had a, a year-long electricity record. There's a whole story about data and what data looks like, what big data and smart data look like, which we can talk about once you've given me a glass of wine, because <laughs> uh, it still gives me nightmares. Uh, but for 383 of the participants, we had a full consumption data record and their attitudes responses. And that showed no link between their attitudinal responses and the electricity that they used. And we think that that is a fairly significant survey and a fairly significant um, finding. So this is what it looks like um, when you see these things uh, in data terms. Okay. So the purple line, all, is here. This is what the sample overall looks like. So this is the variation. So most customers are using electricity in this way, in the purple line. Okay. Um, but this red dotted line is our rural off gas, very distinctly different much more variation and much more extensive level of electricity use. Yeah. So the sample is much more highly varied and it extends to very high levels of electricity use. Okay. This second one here is the high income curve. So that's where you get also a shift. You're seeing the outliers. Is, is, well, you've got outliers in all of them, to be fair, but you've got the density of outliers here in the high income group and you've also got a significant difference in where it peaked. Okay. And you can see that the others are all much more clustered around the middle. So what do we then oops, sorry, clip this clip is apparently a bit broken. I can re clip myself. That works. So when we went into households in the 136 households that we interviewed for, um, some of them we interviewed for four hours, some of them for two hours. What did we find was actually shaping electricity use on the ground? Well, lots of different things, as you might expect with that sort of uh, size of sample. One of the most important is what we call household mobility, that the household is not a kind of static entity. Anybody who actually lives in a household, like all of us in a room, know that. Um, but when we talk about a household, we tend to think of it as quite static terms. But particularly over the last four years, particularly where we were doing our field research in the northeast of England, you've seen significant recession, that's caused financial stress, you've got higher rates of divorce, so you've got families breaking up, people moving back into their parental homes, perhaps bringing with them their, ch their children, so you've got multiple generations under one roof, and when they come, they bring their electricity life with them. So they might, you know, parents want to enable their children to still have an independent life so they have a separate fridge and maybe a separate, uh, they certainly have separate television and all the audiovisual stuff but they probably have a separate fridge. They might also have a separate washing machine but you also get multiple forms of electricity use happening in the same household. Effectively getting two or maybe three sorts of electricity use, families worth of electricity use under one roof and on one meter. Okay, so lots of different kinds of forms of household breakup and recombinations creating a very sort of M mobilized, if you like, uh, sense of the household. And that's not only happening on a permanent basis, but also temporarily. Large extended families getting together over the weekend, Sunday lunch for 12 people at one person's house, no electricity happening in, in the other six households. So you're getting all these sort of variations going on. We found significant blurring of the boundaries between home and work, lots of part-time shift working as well, um, people working from home. So different kinds of electricity use happening at different times of the day because of that as well. Um, the routines of younger and older family members were pretty sacrosanct. 
in terms of shaping our literacy use. So children coming home from school and having tea, for example, or breakfast being having to had at a certain time in order to get everybody out of the house for school or work. Um, a lot of different traditional practices or conventions around meal times, work and school routines. The home economy and how that's structured around different kinds of chores, the sorts of resources that are used, like the wind and the sun or not to dry your clothes, um, the time, the gender division of labour, and the cost of these things are also shaping how electricity is used at home. And as I said before, we find this idea of the evening zone as a liminal space between work and rest really important in shaping how electricity is used at home. So multiple people would tell us that they needed to get everything done before they could relax. Maybe the more people like that in the northeast of England, I'm not sure. Um, but so people would come home and they would try to get the washing on, the drying done, you know, the, kid, the tea cooked and everything. And then once that had all been done, then they could sort of sit down. So electricity became part of getting all of the household work done in a particular time space. Um, and you'll see that that becomes important when we start talking about electric vehicles. Because electric vehicles are also a chore and they fall into that evening liminal zone. As this uh, quote rather nicely says it, what time are you going to start making your tea? Eight or nine o'clock is too late, and three or four o'clock is it's kind of an afternoon snack. So, you know, you have to have it. Five, six o'clock. <coughs> and what we found really is that, uh, and again, probably not much of a surprise to most people in this room, that electricity use is shaped by things. Things use electricity as much as people. It's people and things that use electricity. So the things that you have, and this is why income becomes a very important driver, um, shape the kind of electricity that you use. So when we start to think about what kinds of practices need to be being intervened with if we want to create flexibility, we get those which are taking place between four and eight, those which include appliances that are generally owned, and those which have a high electricity load. So there's lots of things which happen in the four to eight window, like watching TV or charging your mobile phone, but they don't really have a high load. So they're not that important in terms of targeting flexibility. Whereas household chores, cooking, dining, laundry and dishwashing are sort of ubiquitous practices that we found happening in that evening zone. And if we want to start to ta tackle or, or target demand management, it will be around those sorts of things that we suggest that we would need to work. I do want to say a little bit about electricity. So, uh, sorry, about electric vehicles. So as, as well as a control trial, we also looked at those households which had photovoltaics, those which had heat pumps, and those which had electric cars without any other kinds of smart grid interventions. So those sort of low carbon technology households. Um, and I'm just going to use some examples from our EV trial to show you a little bit about what the implications are. Because it's only really in the EV sector, solar and heat pumps are not challenging the grid at the moment, but electric vehicles potentially could. Effectively, if you have an electric vehicle and you're charging it at home, you double your electricity load. So an electric vehicle is like having another house kind of move in with you. Um, what we find is that charging is concentrated in the evening and it coincides with the household peak. This is what we did with about 120 um, households who have electric vehicles, mainly located in Newcastle and Gateshead. <coughs> <coughs> and uh, mainly, but not exclusively, employees of Nissan, because uh, Nissan make the LEAF and Nissan employees are um, able to purchase the LEAF on a, on a cheap rate. And so the majority of electric vehicles in the northeast of England are Nissan employees. Um, owners charge opportunistically, and when the battery is less than half full, they always want to know that it's topped up. I charge it whether it needs it or not, just to max up the miles. There is always this unknown thing. If you want to go somewhere else, just to put it charging up, you've got that flexibility, and it takes two seconds to charge it up, to plug it in. So the idea that their battery might run low, or that it could want to do something with their car and it not be charged, is something that electric vehicle owners are not really prepared to countenance. They always want to have the electric vehicle ready, and so they always charge it, whether the battery needs, needs charging or not, in a physical sense. And this is what we found, about 61% of people um, charging it in the evenings and by the evenings they mean between the sort of 5 and 8 o'clock window. Um, and in our further interviews with people, this also led to this idea of the evening, the sense that they wanted to charge it and just get it done with and know it had been charged before they started relaxing for the evening. And what we see is that actually in the summer, that um, period goes later. 
um, people charge later in the summer than they do in the winter. And that's often to do with where the vehicle is being charged, particularly if it's being charged outside, people are outside and doing other things in the garden and so on. So they still see their electric vehicle and remind, remind, remind themselves they need to do it. So here is what we see in terms of um, the peak, what we call test cell 6 uh, versus test cell 1 is the control. The peak is slightly later as the car gets plugged in here, starts charging, and fills up and then comes off stream. But it's still within what the network management regard as their evening peak window up till 8 o'clock. It's adding a load. This is normalised for the households with electric vehicles. Okay, so that is, if you like, how electricity is currently being used, what we found out about it in headline terms. But I want to also share a little bit with you about some of the interventions that we did around smart um, systems. And here, what we're interested in is thinking about how do you produce or create flexibility um, amongst these customers. So there are four, times, four types of flexibility that we thought about. Time when you do something, location, where you do it, uh, process, how you do it, so you could cook your meal in the microwave or you could cook it in an electric cooker or you could cook it on the hob or inside or you could dry your clothes outside or dry them in the tumble dryer, so that's what we mean by process. Um, abstention or curtailment, you just don't do it. You decide to forego that bag of microwave popcorn for the time that, <laughs> that is the peak hour, okay? And how we've been trying to think about this is um, developing off the idea of social capital, which some of you might know about, the idea of uh, our ability to thrive and survive in societies to do with our connections and our networks and what we call social capital. But we think about flexibility capital. What's our capacity and capital to be flexible? And that's shaped by the gearing model that I showed you. Um, that shapes how flexible we can be. So one of the biggest um, parts of the trial was a time of use intervention, uh, three-banded pricing of electricity provided by British Gas. Uh, that's uh, slightly out of focus for you to see, but effectively there's a day, there's an evening and a night. Um, the day is 4% below the standard rate, the evening is 99% above the standard rate, and the night time between 8 o'clock and 7 in the morning is 31% below the standard rate. So we wanted to see whether introducing um, a static tariff, so it's not dynamic, some of you might know the Low Carbon London project which has been working with a dynamic tariff, um, ours is a static tariff, uh, to see how customers responded. Over 600 customers took part in this trial, it sold out as it were, it was one of the two trials which was extremely easy for us to fill, the others were photovoltaic trials, they were very easy for us to fill as well. Um, people were very interested um, in participating in this kind of use trial. So we did, um, we had some customers join before the sort of official 12 months, so we have some data which goes a bit back in history, but for this cohort of 600 or more, 620 odd, we have 12 months of data that we've looked at. And over this period, they're called TESI, there it is, TESL 9A, sorry, that means the time of use tariff, um, used around 55 kilowatt hours less electricity in the 4 to 8 p.m. period, but around 37 kilowatt hours more at other times. So, uh, m more than our control trial. It's very important to say that this is a comparison between the time of use and the control. It's not a comparison between the year of these participants before they joined the trial and then on the trial. Okay, so it's against the control group, which raises some questions about what we can say in terms of the behaviour change of this particular cohort. Okay, so we actually can't say whether this cohort changed their behaviour or not. We can say what it looks like compared to the control group. And considering the control group's 9,000 people and this is 600 people, and there isn't, they're socially demographically similar enough. That's the basis on which we're drawing our comparison. Um, so there was both a shift in the time of their electricity use and a net reduction. So the trial produces both a shift of electricity use out of the peak and an overall reduction in electricity use, although albeit a small one. It's about two or three days worth of electricity in a year. So these are some of the more details of the findings that we found. 
One of the important things which is captured in the first bullet point is that the trial was persistent. So we found that um, over the, the maximum readings in that four to eight period for electricity use were all lower um, across the whole year and they were statistically significantly lower in seven of the months and importantly actually it was in the winter period that they were mo most reduced. So the trial was most effective in the winter um, by our reading. We did find some more sociodemographic variation here in terms of which kinds of households responded to the trial. So one of our criteria for sorting uh, households was whether they had young, young or old dependents. So if you had younger or older dependents in your household, you were less likely to have shifted your behaviour. If you didn't, then you were more likely to have shifted your routines. If you owned your house rather than renting it, you were also more likely to shift. So if you're a renter or if you had dependent children or dependent uh, or older adults over the age of 65 in your household, you were less likely to have changed. We did a shadow billing exercise, or British Gas did a shadow billing exercise. The participants in the trial weren't informed of this shadow billing exercise until the end, but it was there as a safety net so that nobody lost out financially from being part of the trial. Um, we found that 245 of the 628 participants would have paid more money for their electricity by being on the time of use trial than if they had been on the normal standard rate. On the other hand, that means that 60% of people, 61% of people would have paid less money for their bills over that period of time. And when we're saying, you know, the medium average increase would have been £18.75. So some, it's, it's not a lot of, of gain or loss financially across the whole trial. And again, what we see here in terms of the different groups and their variation in terms of when they use peak electricity, we see that different groups have this different level of flexibility capital and therefore more or less amenable to these kinds of interventions. I'm just going to say a little bit about our solar work as well. And here is one of the, um, this is in a way one of the areas of the trial where what we found out in terms of monitoring energy data and what we found out from talking to people is quite different. So when we talk to people they give us a different story from how the energy data looks. I wouldn't like you to think that it's all seamlessly worked all together and that there would be no contradictions thrown up by doing a large and interdisciplinary project. So, um, and I can tell you a little bit about where we think those contradictions come from. So, what we did in the solar um, test cells were we for one subgroup of solar users, they got um, monitors which showed their import and export. And they were given a whole set of information which encouraged them to use electricity at home rather than exporting it. Um, and this was about the idea of ma managing and maintaining the grid and playing their part in using their own electricity. So they had uh, monitoring and information as a kind of smart intervention. And another set which we call, um, which it actually isn't on this graph, You've got test cell 20 manual, which is a green line. Test cell 5 is normal solar users, and test cell 1 is the um, normalized, uh, is from the control group. We also had a group of customers who were given automatic hot water heating to offset their electricity production from solar. So when they produced solar electricity, it was sunk in, the energy was sunk into a hot water storage. But that's not on this graph. But so what we find is that those people with solar in the red consume more electricity than the normal test cell. And then we find that those people who signed up to having the in-home display consume more electricity than just normal solar customers. So this could be about motivation. It could be those people, if you're going to install solar electricity, you might be the kind of people who consume a lot of electricity, so it works for you to do so. Um, and we don't really, we don't have the before data to compare it with, which is one of the challenges of the project. Um, and then the green line again, if you're more interested in managing your electricity, it may also be because you're a higher consumer. Um, so that's one of the interesting. But what we found is that there isn't any difference in terms of what electricity is used in the peak, in the daytime period, between those who have 
they're monitoring and those who don't. Yet when we talk to people about it, they tell us quite a different story. And we talked to about 35 households um, with solar um, power. And effectively, the social science then t starts to tell us stories about how people narrate their own journeys from before and after, whereas our electricity data only tells us the after story. So we don't know whether these customers were actually previously using less electricity in the middle of the day than they do now. So there's some interesting potential here which requires further work to sort of tease out where the sort of truth in the story lies, and it's probably somewhere in between. But what we effectively find is that for those people who don't, who don't have in-home displays, they are checking their solar electricity all the time anyway. They have developed a range of, of idiosyncratic means, whether this is like calendars on the wall with every day writing down what they're producing, or whether this is sort of log books, or whether it's just family conversations around it. They are recording their electricity use uh, quite avidly. Um, and quite interestedly. So in a way, the in-home display unit becomes an easier way for them to do that, but it's not something that they probably weren't doing beforehand. They were just doing it in a more bespoke or sort of put together way. What we do also find in our interview data is at least that there is a shift from thinking about photovoltaics as a financial relation, basically as a form of pension provision, to sh shifting to see it as a form of also engaging with a wider sensibility around what the grid needs. Indeed, what we're saying that's, is that so important are ways of managing photovoltaics that even without monitoring, customers, customers are making up their own systems. So for us, that seems like an obvious space for more regulated interventions or more easy ways of intervention because everybody who had a solar PV panel wanted to be able to measure or monitor it in some way or another. So it does seem like a space where there's a lot of scope for innovation and, and engagement there. Okay, I'm just going to now um, roll through a few sort of key findings and conclusions before we open it up to discussion and I hope I'm still roughly on time. Okay. <coughs> okay, so what can we say um, are the sort of key social science findings? And I would like, just like to stress that I'm only really talking about you know, perhaps a quarter or a third of the project here and not the network side and not the large customers and a whole set of other things that we could talk about. So headline figures then or headline uh, findings are that we find that electricity use is only weakly determined by conventional socio-demographic variables and here income stands out. Electricity use within low carbon technology households is currently well within industry standards with the exception of electric vehicles and electric vehicles are likely to only become a problem for network management if they're clustered. Electricity use varies significantly within and between households so that standard sort of uh, curve that we're used to about electricity demand masks a wide range of variation and in a way variation is key here uh, at a large scale, there's sufficient variation in the network to mean that it's not under stress, that it is um, able to manage the sorts of demands that we're putting on it. it. But it also suggests that this variation is a source of flexibility. It might look like people, if we just look at that curve which goes up in the morning, down in the middle of the day and then up in the evening, it might look that like there's a very fixed way of using electricity, but actually it's very variable and that suggests there's lots of scope for flexibility within that. And I think that that's quite important to remember. We also find so far that electricity is not, used, is not shaped by attitudes and it's not considered as a matter of choice, but it's a relatively invisible means through which other practices and ends are achieved. We think this idea of capacities, conventions, rhythms, economies and structures is useful for understanding the way in which electricity use is geared and it suggests that some of those gears are more or less amenable to intervention than others. I mean, if you really had a network problem, maybe you would be talking to local schools about whether they could close at two o'clock in the afternoon or not, but those sorts of convention, uh, those sorts of rhythms of everyday work, work and school might be quite difficult to change. Whereas the capacities of households could be changed quite easily. One of the things we found on the time of use trial was that the capacity to shift was really related to whether your dishwasher or your washing machine had a timer switch. Very mundane, small little technology already built in, not that smart a button. 
Um, and then once people started pushing one button on their machines, they started pushing other ones. They said, oh, what's this button? This is an eco-wash button. What does that do? Oh, and that's why we think we also see reduction in electricity use is because people start using their already existing things more smartly because of these kinds of interventions. So interventions make electricity visible and more amenable to intervention again. So you've got one form of intervention, makes it visible, and then you're able to intervene again. So you can get positive circles going here if you start to sort of set off the right kinds of change. But we need to uh, be aware of the fact that this flexibility capital is very varied and might be socially and economically divisive um, if we fail to kind of engage some of the people who might need it most um, to save electricity. So overall from the project, what we find is that the economic case for these kinds of forms of demand-side management doesn't really exist. The sorts of demand-side management that we did don't realise the kind of value that the network requires to make a financial case for doing it on their own. But what we do find is that they're an important part of a combination of interventions to make, demand, to make the grid smart. Okay. <coughs> Well, I think one of the most interesting things that the that, uh, Northern Power Grid have come to recognise is that what they really need is everybody to use a bit less electricity, and that gives them overall headroom. And so, in a way, it's gone from being a project which is concerned with managing the peak to understanding that it's a, a, the grid is an asset which we don't want to stress overall. So if we manage electricity down overall, then we manage the peak and that that might be a, a way in which DNOs need to start operating and they're starting to try and think about what their role in energy conservation, energy efficiency might be. And once we get into that idea that what we want to do overall is overall demand reduction in order to create the headroom that the grid needs, then we start to think that this social life of smart grids becomes very important to understand how to manage demand overall. I think one of our other key findings is that much of the technology or material infrastructure through which we're going to realise a smart grid actually exists in people's homes already or will do very soon. It's the washing machine that people are going out and buying on Friday. It's you know, the television set that they're going to buy at the weekend. And it's all these more mundane devices which we don't really think of as being about the smart grid. We think about high tech, IT, you know, interfaces and so on. But it's actually you know, your toaster It's part of the smart grid. Um, so what kind of toasters is everybody buying? <laughs> what kind of kettles do they have? And how are those, all of those kind of things that we have going to become part of the smart grid? It's not so much an internet of things, it's just things and um, what, what's happening to them. So it's a whole set of other actors which so far might not be so engaged in the notion of the smart grid which we might want to engage. Um, here again we're suggesting that if we want to change um, these sorts of practices we need to move away from thinking about attitudes and financial incentives because they're not likely to work on their own. There are a couple of key things here. I mean, one is that it's the highest income groups who are using the most electricity, who are contributing to the most of the peak and overall uh, demand. Um, information and incentives to work in that group are going to be quite challenging. And so we need to think of other ways of intervening on that as well. But also because we see that attitudes and incentives are not the determining factors shaping electricity use. So if we work on those, we're not likely to get a determinant. Um, this is some of the team <laughs> who've been working on the project with me, whose uh, names I should acknowledge. Sandra, Steve, Clara, Pete at Durham. Gareth, who was at Durham, is now... Uh, Gareth and Robin were both at Durham and have now moved to Newcastle with Gavin and Phil. Christian at Manchester, Ellis, who's moved to Melbourne, um, and David Lynch and Helen Stockton from National Energy Action, who did a lot of the on-the-ground work with us as well. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Fascinating. The thing that really struck me, uh, I think, more than anything else, was the uh, fact that the relationship with income was the only statistically significant relationship you could find. And I guess, as, as with everything, in, in retrospect, it's not that surprising, but it certainly surprised me. So, thank you for that. Uh, so, questions, please, from the floor. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in... Uh, could could, could so people just say that, Mike? Yeah. Jonathan Chambers, uh, Energy Institute, PhD student. Thanks. Um, 
Okay. So I was interested in the results you had for uh, EVs and photovoltaics. Um, do you think that the users who participated in those trials might, by definition, be very unusual? And how do you feel about how those results might apply um, in sort of a broader population, say, as EVs become uh, something you might buy because you want a car rather than something you might buy because you want an electric car? Yeah, OK. <coughs> I think it's important to treat those two groups quite differently. The interesting thing about EVs being owned by the workforce at Nissan is that it's quite a sort of ordinary, you know, middle income, lower middle class demographic. A little bit. It's a little bit of variation there. Um, and so in a, in a way that it's, it's not your kind of high income, tech savvy, want the latest gadget, not somebody who you would necessarily think of as the innovative, you know, the early adopters. Okay, so the EV cohort is quite interesting from that point of view. Um, and what we find with the EVs, although, although they are bought often as uh, the work car, they often become, uh, it's often the women in the household who take over the electric vehicles because they like them so much. So uh, there's a whole set, we, we have got a paper in review at the moment on the gender issues around electricity use in households and we've also got a paper on EVs. But one of the things that happens is that EV becomes a sort of the second family car, it's not the first car, and it becomes used more by the women in the family and it becomes more associated with children and pickups and drop-offs and short journeys and those kind of things. So in a way we think its adoption is relatively normal. I mean we don't think of that as, uh, you know, we think that that is probably as good a way of thinking about how EVs will enter into the uh, car economy, if you like, the social economy of the car as any other. So I think for the EV group we're quite you know, clear that, I mean, they are unusual, they are a particular workforce, there are some things which then shape that, although there's free charging at work at Nissan, the number of, I mean, there are more people who want to charge at work than there are charging points, so there's some competition for that, so they all want to charge at home, and so there are some, some issues. But that, again, isn't that surprising. One of the things we say is that we've got to make sure that we have a, a, an appropriate set of workplace and uh, public charging points, because if we don't, we'll be putting even more load into the evening time. So that's with the EVs. The, the PVs are, again, they're a very interesting group. They, we had quite a lot of re problems recruiting photovoltaic um, to start with because uh, anybody who had a rent-a-roof scheme, we couldn't work with because the people who do a rent-a-roof scheme wouldn't give us the data. That's, their, that's what they own as well as your roof or whatever. They own the panel and they own the panel's data and it became very difficult to sort of work that relationship um, between us and the project. So we ended up with photovoltaics which are owner-occupied and photovoltaics which are on social housing. So in a way we've got kind of two different ends of that spectrum um, in the project. You could think of them as unusual. Um, they might be unusual because they've got investment to make. But um, yeah, the investment's not all coming from them as a household, so there is, there is definitely some demographics about it. But again, in terms of how PV is going to spread, I don't again don't think that that's that unusual an idea to think that it's either going to be institutional investment or high-end investment at least for the foreseeable future. So, in terms of what that means for the network, I think it's it's reasonable in the sh for short-term forecast. <coughs> Hi, Mike Bell from here at the AU Institute. Your time of use tariff trial, you said, was oversubscribed or lots of people... Popular, yeah. Mm. Um, when you did the interviews um, with the participants, were there, what were the things which seemed to be attracting people to, to take part and to go on to that sort of trial? What would people want to get out of it, basically? I, th I think they felt that they could change what they were doing to be able to use the tariff to drive down the, their bill. Um, so I think that that was one reason that they were popular. Um, I think other, yeah, I mean, that was, that was a determining reason. I mean, one of the things that British Gas would say is that they, so when they, whenever anybody comes off a product, like a time of use tariff or any other sort of special offer that you are on from your energy supplier, you then have to choose another product. And British Gas has seen the lowest fall off 
of any end of any of their products as people transfer off the time of use. They stayed with British Gas much more than any other tariff. So there's something about feeling also, uh, well, what also what their um, like customer call satisfaction stuff says is that they feel sort of looked after, like the energy industry knows who they are, or they feel that they have a, a, a better relationship with their supplier. And I think that they they felt that was a positive aspect of it. Yes. So uh, this project is on the local network. Yes. Um, um, the requisite funding is that the distribution network operators actually share what they learn yes. with the other distribution network. Yes. So what is the takeaway message for that particular group of stakeholders? Yes. Well, the results have been shared in lots of different ways in that we've we've done the, as, you, as you probably know, there are LCNF conferences every year, have been since the start of the project, and all the results are always presented at those um, occasions. Uh, there are something like 60 reports online, and all the data sets processed are also online and available, so all the material is there. Um, so in a, in a sense, each DNO can choose which of the findings <laughs> that they think are most important. Um, I think... From the customer side of things, the lessons for DNOs are probably around this question of overall demand management being as effective as any demand management for particular peaks and what they might need to think about a new relationship with customers to try to achieve demand reduction rather than just dealing with peak demand reduction. That's one thing. Um, we've also done a lot of modelling about the Im impacts or implications of the rates of PV uptake and how they're being used and what that might mean for network capacity and also the uptake of EVs and what that will mean for network capacity. And so I think the findings there about the rollout of different kinds of low carbon technologies on the UK network at the moment and whether they do or don't challenge existing industry standards for network reliability, that's another key aspect of what we've done here in terms of being able to marry up the rollout of those technologies and how they're being used in practice every day to tell network operators something about how they could predict what implications they're going to have for networks. So I think that's another key thing. But those two areas, I'd say. Yes. I'm going to steal Citizens' advice. Is okay to ask a couple of questions? Ask first, but if it's short, I'll let you have a while. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, the first is, I think you mentioned that um, there's some knowledge about ways that some group are kind of demographically unusual because they're early smart meter adopters. Yes. Uh, I wondered how much detail there is available on yep. unusual, you know, the ways they're unusual. Yeah. Do you want me to tell you the answer to that? Yes. Okay, so. <laughs> So um, when British Gas rolled out this uh, version of smart metering that we were using for the majority of participants on the trial, then there were criteria that, they, that a customer had to meet in order to have a smart meter, uh, which you probably know what they are, but they are about um, whether they are credit reliable, basically. So they needed to have uh, a credit history with British Gas, or be, and they would go to their, their customers who hadn't churned and also then went on prepayment meters. So is, is that uh, they would be proactively offered to any customer that was credit reliable? Yes. Or it's not something customers had to see No. Um, I was also going to ask just uh, if similar programs to be rather than in the future, is there any particular lessons that you would pass on to? If, it, well, if, if another trial was going to be run in the future, yeah, would be there any less? Response. Um, it, it is one thing that you would want to do differently from Zillow. Yeah, I suppose like pretty much any research project that I've been in, like you know, lots of different <laughs> things you could do differently. I mean, I think this is probably where my data nightmares start to come on board. Um, when we think about data from smart meters, we tend to think of it as being data that is ready to use. It is not ready to use. Um, data that comes from smart meters, the smart meters on this project were subcontracted by British Gas through three or four different companies who run the smart metering. Uh, each of those 
data sets is not compatible with the others. Um, that took the project team a very long time to create a clean data set to <coughs> use. Um, there's also then questions about when you start recruitment for the project. So we were recruiting into the time of use trial because we wanted to get a long, as long a period as we could on the time of use trial, but those customers might only have been given a smart meter three months before that, so then we didn't have a year's worth of energy data to compare it with. So, if I, so in data terms, what I would say is you need to recruit people onto smart meters, but then you need to not start your trial a year or 18 months later so that you've got the baseline data from all of those customers before you then go into the trial. That makes a project very long and even more expensive. Um, but it, I mean, it's worth saying, I mean, the, the value of this project and its, its large budget has mainly gone on network interventions. I mean, it's actual, actual changes on networks to make them more stable and reliable than they would have been before. The, the finance bit of the project that has done all of this has been yeah. much less much less money than that. So, as, as ever, the big cash goes on the big ticket items um, and, and on the network itself and is actually doing real work on the network right now. This is, this is less money, but even still would make a project very much more expensive to do it over that long extended time scale that you would need to do it in that way. Yes. Um, so, the, the income that you point out, so does, does it like conform to the, the literatures about other countries in the similar behaviors? I mean, or is it like a, that kind of tendency is like the strongest in, in the British household um, in your views? That income, yeah, to, I mean, that's a very fair point, is to say that we haven't done a lot of comparison about what this looks like in relationship to other smart grid trials elsewhere um, in terms of what are the factors that are shaping electricity use. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't be able to say to you whether that's true or not, but I'd be very interested in your view. So, that chip with a quick follow-on with respect to the um, finding on income. Yeah. Did you do any work to control for house size? Yeah. Um, and was there still an income effect once you'd controlled yeah. for the size of the room? Yeah. There was. Okay. Yeah. And did that did it drop off the magnitude of that effect substantially? Um, I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly, um, and not we don't have household dwelling size for all of the 9,000, so that's you know it's a subset of the of the work that we've got that for. Um, we have got yeah, it, as far as we could tell, it didn't. And I think the 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 key thing that we did there was look at the mosaic categories, which helps us also with household size and well certainly with with them. Um, family size, not with dwelling size. I, 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 think, I think the thought here uh, is that it's the stuff that's using yes. the electricity. Yes. The stuff has to have somewhere to live. Yes. And people with bigger houses have more space for stuff. That's true. Um, but uh, yeah, but, but that relationship between household size and energy use has mainly been proven in relation to heat and hot water. And I think that that is the, that is the key thing. It's the distinction between household and the house. Yes, yes, I, I do understand that. But, uh, but equally, I think that m most of our sort of psyche about what are the factors that shape energy use are because most of our studies are about energy per se. And we haven't broken out hot water, heating and electricity sufficiently to look at that variation. And, and so all of our sort of normal ideas about what shapes energy use shaped by total energy use and of course total energy use in the UK is mainly driven by heat and so then household size, income, the nature of properties, renting and all of that is all to do with that as understanding of total energy use but as electricity becomes a higher proportion of our household energy use then we might start needing to sort of question some of those norms a bit. I'm going to take a couple more questions. Yes. You need to explain to me what a Hawthorne effect is. It's just whenever your control group actually changes their behaviour because yeah. they know they're involved in the trial. Yeah. No. As far as we've got data for over two two year period for the control group and we don't see any shift in how they're behaving. I would say that the control group have only a very limited sense of understanding that they're part of a trial. They were asked to opt out of having their data analysed by a consortium <coughs> of university and energy 
um, partners. And they were only asked once at the beginning of a two year period. So their understanding of being part of a trial and being watched in that way is probably, I wouldn't have thought that that was sufficient to change how, for them to feel that they were part of a trial in, in, in that sense. You didn't see any variation whatsoever in the control group, given that there's products, you know, more efficient fridges, uh, etc. Given weather adjustment, given well, uh, any other independent I, variable. Well, I think what it, what I said first of all is that we saw an enormous amount of variation in the control group, but but not in terms of any particular cohorts. That households, day in day out, their electricity use on one day might be three times as much as it was on the next day and then the next day is twice and then on Saturday it's half again. The amount of variation in any single household is so large that it might mask those other kind of variations which are controlled from outside. I'll take one more question. Yes? Uh, Sam Bolton, Bolton Desk. Um, I'm interested in the relationship between climate change and energy efficiency. Two quick questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the first one is around uh, Okay, so on the EV side of things, the answer is no. It's straightforwardly, charging the electric vehicle became part of the household routine that needed to be done in the evening time. Um, and there's quite, a, across the project team, it might not surprise you to know, well, it, I mean, there are more than 100 people across all of the different organisations that have been mentioned who worked on this project over the last four years. And some of them are EV drivers, so they have particular things to say about EV. But one of the big points of contention was whether people would or wouldn't use timers, switches. And in our discussions in, in households, people were really not very keen on the idea because they wanted to know that it had been charged. So I'm going to patent a timer switch that plays a little bit of household music. So when it's on in the garage, then the people in the household know that it's charging. Okay, so that's my, uh, that's my small grid invention, uh, so that we can manage the EV charging. But they just wanted to know that it had been done, so that it would be ready for the morning. Just in the same way as that you might get your child's packed lunch box ready the night before, so that you don't have to do it in the morning, or you don't get caught out by your child not having lunch. You want the car to be ready. It was seen in that kind of way. Um, so to the second question, in terms of abstention, where did the abstention come from? Did we see anything? Well, where would the different kinds of flexibility capital would come from? Well, one of the kind of things that we saw with people on time of use tariffs is that they would take their washing, for example, to their mum's house and do it there. So <laughs> that's why we did actually see a sort of physical, geographical sort of spread of laundry beyond the house. So there was some sort of shifting of things outside. Um, I think that the, the challenge in a way of what we're saying about those people who, for those actors and organisations who want to engage with demand management, which is a little bit different from the DNO audiences, maybe more the suppliers and the policy makers, is that the sorts of things we need to know about people, we don't really know about them yet. So people who are batch cookers, for example, people who cook at the weekend and freeze it and then heat it up during the week, they are very flexible. But where are they? Are they holding their hands up in the survey and saying, yes, I cook at the weekend? We don't know that about people. We don't know about the kinds of stuff they have in their houses. We don't know whether they have timers on their washing machines. But effectively, there's lots of the elements which would comprise this flexibility capacity that we just don't record. And so there's something there about how we understand the layout of where this flexibility capital might be. There are some obvious things, like people who work shifts, um, there are people who are at home in the day because they work at home or because they're, they're of a pensionable age or they might have young children. Um, so there are, there are structures and conventions that shape people's capacities where we might be able to intervene most readily. But that other set of capacities, at the moment, we don't really have a good sense of. So we might need some crowdsourcing. We might need Jamie Oliver to do a TV program about flexible cooking or something like that. Uh, some different kinds of interventions. Okay.